Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and I'm here today with our great panel, as always, Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. And you might have noticed, if you are a regular listener or watcher of the FeeCast, that we actually missed last week's episode because we had this little thing called FeeCon here in Atlanta, (laughs) and it was three days of really amazing content, panels, presentations, speeches, Musical performances. Brittany, you and I were the MCs That's for the right. event, yep. which was pretty awesome. It was. It's interesting because if you've never been on stage like that, you don't know that when you're on stage, you can't see everybody. I loved that part. The lights <laughs> are shining right in yeah. our eyes. Uh, so it actually makes it feel like a cozier room, except for all of the yes. echoes. And uh, all the applause, of course, right. because we can't help it. Right. Um, <laughs> so... We did a couple of very special episodes at FeeCon with live studio audiences, one of which was with T.K. Coleman, the education director and co-founder of Praxis. We were talking about taking control of your own life and actually uh, imagining what you can actually achieve and taking that and doing it. It was a great conversation. It was an amazing conversation. And we also spoke with Magat Wade, who is an amazing Senegalese-American entrepreneur Mm -hmm. that we have profiled in a new video, a new Mm -hmm. documentary that we have coming out in the next few weeks here. Another very amazing story. So we'll have, uh, actually those have come out now, and so you can see those on the FeeCast channel if you're interested. They are in a different set, but with the same amazing people that you've grown used to all the time. So I figured that we might actually talk a little bit about some of our other sort of highlights from FeeCon. What what else, aside from the blinding lights of the uh, amazing audience uh, plenaries, did you did you love at FeeCon? There was one, actually, Dan, you moderated this panel that was a primer on Austrian economics that I really enjoyed with Dan uh, D'Amico and Donald Boudreau from Mercatus. It was amazing. I think it kind of kind of gave an introductory kind of lesson on why we should even care about Austrian economics to begin with. Um, so that was my favorite. I really liked another panel I moderated about the environment. Um, so it kind of took an environmentalist ends as given, but uh, some of the panelists especially, really had free market means to those same ends. And so especially highlighting property rights as a, the best way to conserve our resources as opposed to government regulation. And of course, these ideas are not very often heard when we're talking about these concepts like mm-hmm. environmentalism. So that's special. Marianne, how about you? Nobody had more fun at FECON than me. I was live tweeting the whole event. So I was running around everywhere. I went to a significant amount of the breakout sessions, all of the keynote speakers, and it was fun. I saw the panel that Dan mentioned. Uh, one of my favorite parts was screenings by Free the People yeah. and Reason. Austin and Meredith Bragg from Reason uh, spoke a little bit about their videos, and they had one really great comment, which I'll share with you, which was, when it comes to YouTube comments, you smell them, you don't eat them. Oh, that's good. That's <laughs> true. Good. And actually, Meredith and Austin were filmmakers in a Thursday night presentation we had of a series of films with mm-hmm. Tellius and Nexus, our friends there. They presented their film, Demand Curve, which was also mm-hmm. very, very fun. We had four other films in that presentation that I hope we'll be able to share with our viewers very shortly here. That I being w- said, we welcome YouTube comments. So your smell, oh, of course. Your smell great. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder really briefly, because uh, you mentioned it, Brittany, if I could ask for a very brief definition of Austrian economics, because we're not talking about the economics of Austria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's no, Austrian economics? It's not the unemployment rate in Vienna. <laughs> I, I would call it, um, in, in a lot of ways, the study of human behavior, okay. of human action. Um, why do we do what we do? It doesn't matter if X amount of people buy this certain brand or something. Why? Why do we make that choice? So it's almost like sociology, uh, and that's why it's appealing to me. It's practical economics. And it's really um, scientific in the sense that it's exact because it's logical. It's, it's logical deduction. It's what can you say about action that is always true? And, you know, historically, things will vary. There will be, you won't be able to say exactly why someone did something. But given these uh, constraints, you can, for example, know that minimum wages cause unemployment. Right. Um, and that's not a historical contingency. That's something that you can know scientifically, actually. And this, of course, is named the Austrian School of Economics because it comes from Austria, from a number of thinkers there in the late 19th century. Karl Menger, I believe, is kind of the, the godfather, <clears throat> so to speak, of Austrian economics. Yeah, the founder <laughs> is Karl Menger, uh, who in 1871 wrote Principles of Economics. Uh, and he was 
part of what's called the marginal revolution where it really refounded uh, economics as opposed to the labor theory of value. It, it established mm -hmm. the subjective theory of value, right. which really put human valuation uh, and human choice, especially consumer choice, at, uh, at the helm of the economy. Uh, and then his student, Eugen von Bavark, uh, did a lot of on the, the business cycle and time, time preference theory of interest. And, um, and Ludwig von Mises was his student. We and, talked about him before on the yes. FECAST. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. someone, right? We know him. Do you think that it's fair? I like to think of Austrian economics as being a little bit more molecular, where we're starting from the individual and building on from there, as opposed to starting with the aggregate. Do you think that's fair? That's exactly right. Uh, it's very much what Mises called method uh, methodological individualism. And so instead of, for, for example, Keynes deals with huge aggregates, the Keynesian mm -hmm. economics. And, um, but what the Austrian economics does is it, it uh, starts with individual choice and then, um, and then builds up from there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't skip any steps. Yeah. It's almost the most the most micro microeconomics, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's mm -hmm. as small as you can possibly get. Right, right. <laughs> Nanoeconomics. Nanoeconomics. <laughs> and it and it has macroeconomics because like the business cycle theory, that's basically macroeconomics, but it's mm -hmm. built up from the microeconomics. Our axiom whereas, is is the individual. Right? right. Whereas other schools it's just like kind of two separate realms, like mm -hmm. macro and micro, and they don't really interrelate. Yeah, I think that's more respectful of the individual instead oh, of just lumping people together. Mm -hmm. And reality, it's more respectful of, like you said, actual what actually happens. Yes. <laughs> And speaking of what actually happens, we had a bunch of other things at FECON, mm -hmm. right? So we had uh, a track called uh, on creativity, yes. right? We had a track mm -hmm. about challenging statism, which is basically looking at how the government is actually interfering in our daily lives and how we might be able to hack that or challenge that. We had a track on market urbanism, which is all about mm -hmm. using market forces, the individual, to actually solve environmental problems that exist in the world. Uh, speaking of the keynotes, just thinking about the creative kind of keynotes we had, and of course we'll have all sorts of uh, keynote videos up online very shortly if we don't already, we had Tina Go, who was an amazing cellist, yes. Yes. and she performed at the beginning of Friday's mm -hmm. sessions. Wait till you see this video. She is so passionate. And she actually plays through the entire Wonder Woman mm -hmm. theme, which mm -hmm. she actually was the cellist uh, yes, for the on, on mm -hmm. and the composer mm -hmm. on Wonder Woman and then gives a talk and then comes back and does a parting Game of Thrones theme on her cello, <laughs> which was amazing. Amazing. We, were, we got a different angle than most people since we were backstage, but it was magnificent. Yeah, most people mm -hmm. think that that theme from Wonder Woman is an electric guitar, yeah. but it's really an electric cello that it, mm -hmm. she sounds like, uh, you know, a virtuoso in a heavy metal band. But her story about being an entrepreneur was so, so inspiring about how she was just a college student shopping at the dollar store, right. you know, mm -hmm. kind of how do I make money with my art? And that's what I think a lot of people were there to kind of learn is you have, you know, specialization, we believe in that you have this one skill. Okay, what do you do then? How do you make money from this? And so she was really inspirational. Yeah. For her story was reason. amazing. And of course, you know, in these plenary sessions with everyone in the room, yeah. we wanted to add a little bit of entertainment so they could take a break from really thinking as hard as they are during the, the panels and the presentations downstairs mm -hmm. in this case and actually be entertained. So that was the whole idea yeah. behind FECON was to give them an awesome experience. One of my favorite parts about FECON in particular and fee seminars in general is that you don't always know even right after it happens, how it's going to impact you. There's going to be things weeks, months from now that we think back to and can draw inspiration from, and I think that's amazing. Yeah, James Walpole, has a, uh, one of our writers, has a great post where he talks about the emotional high point for him in the conference was when uh, a violinist, and could you help me with the pronunciation of his name? Willie. Oh, Willie. Willie, Willie Ortega. Ortega. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he uh, is famous for uh, protesting in Venezuela, uh, against the regime there mm -hmm. and being persecuted for that. And so you could just really see the emotion that built up from that experience in his live performance. And so it was just such a great confluence of, you know, the emotional, the, the political, the principle, the ideological, the artistic, all in one performance. And, and he, he was moved to tears. And we'll have that video mm -hmm. up online as well. It, it started with him kneeling on the stage with his yes. violin and mm -hmm. he's wearing a shirt with the Venezuelan flag on it and then he is uh, on the background you've got all this video of him being arrested beaten up yeah. and he was later imprisoned for so emotional they uh, broke his violin they too. broke his violin yeah. mm -hmm. so he came to FECON and uh, it was probably one of the most moving 
moments yeah. of the entire conference. So we were we were extremely happy to have him there. So we are going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the rest of the FeeCast. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for the Foundation for Economic Education. And I want to talk to you today about Fee's podcasts. You're currently listening to our wonderful FeeCast, but did you know we also have two other amazing podcasts for you to listen to each and every week? There's Words and Numbers featuring Anthony Davies and James Harrigan, where they talk about economics, political theory, and current events every Wednesday. We also have a brand new offering called the Fee Audio Experience, where we bring you content from our seminars and events held all across the country. You'll get to hear fascinating talks from speakers and panelists, which we'll make available to you right after each event. So be sure to check out the Fee Cast, Words and Numbers, and the Fee Audio Experience right here on our homepage at fee.org shows, and also subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We were talking as we went into the break about FeeCon. Now we want to kind of switch gears a little bit and answer the question that always comes up, which is when you're talking about with uh, people, your political philosophy, and you might suggest, well, maybe government should do less. Maybe government should be uh, maybe in the role of providing the services of a night watchman state only, providing for policing and maybe courts. People inevitably ask us, but if the government's not doing all the things that it does now, who will build the roads? And this question always presents a challenge to people who believe in a very limited government. And this week, there's news out of wherever Domino's Pizza is based <laughs> that perhaps they have an answer to that. They do have the answer to it. Domino's will build your roads. And in fact, they've already, I think, repaired 50 potholes. So Domino's is unleashing this new plan, uh, Paving for Pizzas. Which, which sounds delicious. Sounds delicious and exactly <laughs> as it sounds. So they are actually coming to your town if you nominate your town, and they're going to fix the potholes that are causing your pizza to be delivered I guess not in perfect form. So the 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 rhetoric goes that the pizza men are, are there, your pizza's on the front seat or passenger seat. They get to your house, they go over a pothole. That pizza goes flying. Pizza's ruined. Domino's pizza has to Armageddon. make a new one. Pizza Armageddon. Chaos ensues. No longer. So are they doing <laughs> this out of the goodness of their own heart, or is there some self-interest involved? There's always self-interest involved, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so. Even the democratic socialists have self-interest. Exactly. So how, how could their <laughs> bottom line benefit from from this yeah venture. well so if all these pizzas are getting destroyed which apparently they are because this is enough of a problem where it's causing you know disruption in their business model people aren't getting their pizzas in, in the quality that they are promised to them because of these potholes mm -hmm. so it's in domino's best interest so they so, won't have to remake those pizzas mm. and then use their employees who should be working on a different order but are now forced to remake the pizzas or if people just stop ordering from them because they keep getting because their they keep getting ruined yeah. exactly mm -hmm. but now you have fixed roads which means literally everyone benefits. The driver gets there safely, your pizza gets there safely, consumers can get to the store and back safely if they choose to pick it up, and the entire community gets a better road. Yeah, yeah. even people who have nothing to do with Domino's nothing are benefiting. Nothing to do with it, yeah. And in economics, that would maybe be called a free rider problem. Yes. Right? <laughs> and no uh, pun intended with uh, the roads comment. But this is an interesting thing, right? I mean, Domino's has been doing a couple of gimmicks along these mm -hmm. lines. They have this pizza insurance. They have, uh, you know, for instance, if you end up bringing your pizza through carryout back home and uh, as the commercial has it, a tree hits the car and destroys the pizza or you, you slip on ice after the, the tree hits your car and flips the pizza yeah. over, you go right back to the Domino's shop and they remake your pizza. And so they're very interested in making sure that their customers actually get a mm -hmm. quality pizza. And this... I think we could use in Atlanta. I think with some of the potholes that we have here in the roads, mm -hmm. I would like to nominate Atlanta. Perhaps I yep. have a second. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes. we probably have four votes for Atlanta, so we'll you know <laughs> upvote that that request on there. And yeah, so, I mean, and there's a good reason for that because we are not really their customers. So they we're kind of captive. Who's customers? Speak for yourself. Uh, the, <laughs> the the government's customers right. in terms of paving Atlanta's roads and and maintaining them and. Uh, and so, you know, they don't really need to keep us happy that that we're the, the money they're getting from us is not mm -hmm. money that we could spend somewhere else. Like we just have to pay pay taxes. Right. And no matter how badly a job they do, we have to continue. 
And um, whereas if, if we were their customers, they would have every incentive to keep us happy. And you mean by their customers, you mean the government, because of course, right. uh, I am a Domino's customer, so I'm definitely vested <laughs> in, in, in interest <laughs> over there. Um, so paving for pizza, right, and everything else, that's the name of this thing. Everyone else benefits from it. What about the people who would say, well, you know, of course, when the government builds the roads, it's done through taxpayer dollars and everyone benefits. So that's the only just way to do it. How would you counter that? I mean, well, I, would, oh, I would say that that might be how we've seen it done for some number of decades, but they don't do it well. They spend a lot of money to do it. And from a lot of the reports I've been reading, the building of the roads isn't even the problem. The initial expansion and laying down of the foundations that's all well and good within parameters. The real problem is maintenance. Yeah. And that's what I think is the most interesting thing about paving for pizzas is that they're tackling the bigger issue, which is maintaining the roads. And I've got a statistic for you, Richard. Always with the data. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Between 2004 and 2008, states dedicated 55% of their budgets, a total of $20.4 billion on expanding roads, which only accounts for 1.3% of all roads. The other 98.7% uh, only received 43% of the budgets. And as we can see in our city and other cities, there are big problems. The roads aren't being well-maintained by the government. It's great to see a private organization stepping in and doing something about it. And so we have all of these roads in the U.S., most of which, I believe, are funded by some level of government. Mm -hmm. Was that always the case? Actually, no. I mean, there was uh, one of the first highways in uh, U.S. history was called the, the Lincoln Highway, and it was privately, it was a private initiative. So there was um, uh, entrepreneurs in the automotive industry, in the, uh, in the tire industry, um, and they, they, they realized that if there was a road that made it easier for people to, to um, get from place to place and travel long distance across right. the country, then that would be a big boost to the automotive industry. And so they created a private foundation to make this happen, and it really helped. It, it, it really worked. And it was only later that, that the federal government stepped in and crowded that out. Let's talk about crowding out real quick. What does that mean? Uh, crowding out is when... Uh, Government expenditures um, make it harder for private competitors to operate in that area. So, for example, with public schools, that it may be substandard public schools, but they're free. And so it's, it's at least hard no to, charge. Right. No charge. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, fr free to the consumer, not free to, to society. We have to fund it with with taxes. And so that makes it harder for private schools to, to right. em emerge and compete. Because those private school parents are essentially paying double. They're paying mm -hmm. for public schools and their taxes, and then they're, pri they're paying privately for their schools, for their children. That's right. And so why wouldn't private schools be crowded out because of such great investment in public schools by government? Hmm. Uh, well, they would be. They, they would be crowded out by, um, by public investment. But they still exist. Uh, oh, oh, you mean completely? Yeah. Crow crowded out. Yeah, I mean, uh, so they're crowded out in the sense that uh, there aren't as many as would have been otherwise. Right. But, um, and I yeah. think that, you know, when we're talking economics, we're always talking about things on the margin. Right. Are there going to be some percentage of people who are willing to pay both, pay for public schools and for private? Yes. But the people on the margin who are choosing between, you know, sending their kids to school in clean clothes versus paying for their education. Exactly. So this 1912 highway organization is crowded out by the federal government when it ends up building an enormous amount of roads. And later, of course, we have the Eisenhower interstate system mm -hmm. that most people might not even recognize was intended specifically to be a military program mm -hmm. so that the military could easily mobilize. And in fact, there's a certain uh, rule in the interstate highway system manual that says every certain number of miles must be flat or straight enough, rather, mm -hmm. so that a plane can land on it. And these are all notions that I think are, are hidden by sort of our re usual rhetoric that only an organization as large and as well-resourced, as well-funded as the government, has the ability to do things such as roads. But we see from these examples in the past that that wasn't always the case. Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes what happens is that 
um, government jumps in and sort of hijacks the pro progress that private sector made and repurposes it towards its own uses. So whereas you know, this was uh, the, the original freeways were about commerce and about trade that, you know, the government with the, especially with the Eisenhower highway highways that it repurposed it for military uh, purposes, which, you know, to, to some extent is for destruction and not creation. And you, you saw that with, uh, you know, the ancient Rome, that um, that a lot of the Roman roads were for military purposes. And a lot of people think of that, oh, well, you know, that's good because it's about defending the empire. Mm -hmm. But it was also about subjecting the subjects of right. the empire so, so that they say all roads lead to Rome. Well, all leads, roads lead out of Rome, too, so that the army from Rome could march out and uh, suppress any kind of uh, uprising of someone who wanted to break out of a, a, a a community that wanted right. to break out of the empire. Right. Well, just as all roads lead to Rome, all roads at this point in our fee cast lead to the break. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for the Foundation for Economic Education. And I want to talk to you today about Fee's podcasts. You're currently listening to our wonderful Fee cast, but did you know we also have two other amazing podcasts for you to listen to each and every week? There's Words and Numbers featuring Anthony Davies and James Harrigan, where they talk about economics, political theory, and current events every Wednesday. We also have a brand new offering called the Fee Audio Experience, where we bring you content from our seminars and events held all across the country. You'll get to hear fascinating talks from speakers and panelists, which we'll make available to you right after each event. So be sure to check out the Fee Cast, Words and Numbers, and the Fee Audio Experience right here on our homepage at fee.org slash shows, and also subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the Fee Cast. We were talking in the break about certain fictional renditions of the world in which we inhabit, and one of them, of course, comes to mind, which is where we're going, we don't need roads. And of course, that reference from Back to the Future comes into your article as it well, does. which we have a link to in the underneath the video so that you can read what Brittany wrote about all this paving for pizza nonsense, which actually sounds pretty good if we can get it here in Atlanta, which I'm <laughs> extremely stoked about. I would love to see that. And I'm a big as any Domino's fan. So the question is, if I'm a Domino's fan and I'm constantly ordering from this company that's patching the roads uh, in order to uh, get me my pizza, what kind of problems does that make apparent? I mean, economically, socially, if I'm paying for roads to be paved through my direct expenditure on pizza, is there an issue with that? Well, it brings up the issues of, of public goods, which is a term that economic, uh, economists use for uh, goods that are non-excludable, uh, so it's it's hard to exclude uh, any particular individual from it, and um, non-rivalrous, yeah. where someone using the good doesn't deprive someone else from getting the benefit of the good. So an, an example of a public good that is often raised is is a dam. So you, you have a dam, and it benefits the whole community, and you can't really say like, okay, well you and this community you don't get the benefit of the dam. Uh, you can't exclude people from, from it. And you, you also, also if you, someone moves into the community, it's not like, oh, okay, well, he's benefiting from the dam and that makes me benefit from the dam less. Right. So, so the, the argument that a lot of economists use is that for public goods, you have to have the government provide the dam right. or the government to build the roads. Otherwise, people wouldn't be in, uh, incentivized to, uh, to pay for uh, enough of a supply of the good. So, for example, a dam is a public good in the economic sense where mm -hmm. it's not excludable. You can't say, Bob, because you didn't pay for this thing, you won't have the benefit of the dam. And it's non-rivalrous, meaning if all four of us consume the benefit of the dam, a fifth person coming in cannot not uh, be benefited from it. Exactly. A pizza, on the other hand, would definitely be a non-public right. good. It would be a private good. It yes. would because it's because rivalrous. not everyone's getting a piece of the pie. Apparently, Is that what you would say. <laughs> We're Sorry. just full of Domino's <laughs> references all day because, of course, that's their rewards program that I have way too many points in. So it's interesting that you mention uh, public goods, Dan, because 
there are a couple different definitions, of course. Mm -hmm. When most people are talking in the public sphere, they're talking about it in a non-economic sense, which basically means for the good of the public, the greater good. Yes. But this economic sense of a public good is a very specific definition. Mm -hmm. And I want to read a couple things to you right here because I think it's important. It's interesting because I usually go to Merriam-Webster. And in this case, Merriam-Webster does not have a definition for public good, so I'm not able to tell you uh, how popular of a term this is to look up. I'm sure it's not very popular, but here we go. On Google, it basically means a commodity or service provided without profit to all members in a society, either by the government or by a private individual or organization. And the second definition is what we said, which is the benefit mm -hmm. or well-being of the general public. So they even say in economics, this is something that is not done for profit. See, the problem I would have with that definition is that it's according to what the government does. It's not according to like the nature of the good. So, right. so for example, the government could provide free mugs to everyone and not, not charge them and then call that a public good. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's non-rivalrous. And, right. non and there are public goods that don't have to be provided by the government. I like to think of radio as one example, where it would be very costly to try to exclude people from tuning their radios to your station. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily have to be provided by any kind of government or state. And I think it's also worth noting that the government owns no road company. So when we're talking about that, like no profit, actually a road company is profiting and they're profiting from your tax dollars because again, the government does not have the government road company that goes and paves your way. You know, they take your funding that you that we all fund and they use it somewhere else in, in the private sector. So there is someone profiting and they're profiting off your dollars, but you have no say in what happens to that. And hence the problem that we come up with all the time of contracts that are done without bidding. Mm -hmm. And so our politicians are actually giving their friends the contracts that are really good rate, maybe not in the best interest of the public good, the yeah. greater good. Mm -hmm. So I guess the thing that I'm wondering about paving for pizzas and dominoes is that's really cute. Thanks for filling some potholes. And bellies. And bellies. <laughs> <laughs> not to not to miss out on that one. But what good does that do us if we want to build a new highway? What do we how do we scale this out? We can't depend on dominoes to fix all the roads. They've got pizzas to 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 bake. Well, well, for one thing, that lots of businesses have an incentive to mm -hmm. get people to them. Every mm -hmm. business, unless you're an online solely business, and even then you have delivery trucks. So literally every business needs the road. Right, right. And um, so, so making it easy to come to. Um, and so when you, when you think about malls, that they're kind of providing mm -hmm. public goods too, because they, there are like thoroughfares and walkways through, through there that um, people aren't paying for. Uh, but it's in their incentive to, they want to make it easy to walk to their store. So let me ask you this then, if it's in all of these people's interest to pave the roads, why don't we just hit them with a good old tax? Let's just let the government tax these organizations, get that needed money for the roads. Why is that not a great idea? They already have the money and look what's happening. So it looks like, like making, giving the government the power to say, okay, I'm going to do this with the money. Again, you're taking away the demand, right? The consumer can't directly say, right. no, I don't like this. They'd have to go through not only bureaucracy, but also some middleman, you know, that's also being paid to do this work. It, it would be exactly what we have going on now. Mm -hmm. right. And so this kind of always brings up the question, talking about public goods. There's also a very interesting mm -hmm. difference in the way that we talk in economics about the public and the way that the colloquial usage of that word uh, happens, right? So when most people talk about the public, we talk about something that is government run or, or operated or funded, right? So public schools, for example, yeah. are uh, given that, that name, public. But truly, public has a very different meaning. And I wonder if maybe we could sort of weigh in on that a little bit. Yeah, public generally refers to just people. And so like, Public businesses are businesses that are open to the public. And uh, even in, I think in the UK, public schools actually means private schools mm. because it's schools that are open to, right. the, to the public. It's um, for the people. And, um, and I think that there's something insidious about lumping the notion of public with the notion of government because basically they're, they're saying that the government is us, is right. the people, right. uh, or, or at least represents the will of the, the people in some profound way, when really they often don't. I know someone who insisted 
upon public schools being referred to as government schools, mm -hmm. simply because it is an insidious sort of conflating of ideas, sort of the government side along with the interests of the public. A lot of the time, those don't line up. Right. Yeah. And then most, what, maybe most of the time. <laughs> perhaps. What, what that leads to is this great quote that Bastiat, uh, this economist, French economist Frederick Bastiat talked about, that he, he said that, Whenever I say that I don't want, I mean, this is a paraphrase. Whenever I say I don't want the government providing education, people take that to mean that I'm anti-education. Mm -hmm. When I say I don't want the government providing food, that I'm anti-food. And that kind of um, linguistic merging leads to that kind of fallacy. Well, it's similar also to what we were talking about in a previous episode where we were defining socialism, and one of the ways in which we found people were talking about it was that it equals generosity, mm. right? And so if people think socialism equals generosity, public e equals government, you can see very easily how people would support things that are funded to be public or funded by the public and right. think that that is serving, yeah. in general, that greater good that we all seek to achieve. Right. When really it is businesses that are more public in a sense, because they are driven by consumer demand. And, um, and th there's no middle man in the way of the government claiming to represent their wills. They are actually expressing their will with every dollar they, they, they spend. Like Mises said that the market is like uh, a, a democracy in right. which every dollar is a vote. And very rapidly responding to the wishes mm -hmm. and needs and wants of all of us individuals in that uh, sense that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all the wishes and needs and wants of this group of people is to probably have a pizza right now. So I think <laughs> we're going to end the fee cast and we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great weekend. <laughs>